This week, Designing Minds features Yves Behar, the renowned industrial designer of the Jawbone wireless headset and the $100 laptop. In the first of three episodes, Eve explores the roots of his unorthodox approach to industrial design, rethinking the fundamental identity, meaning, and purpose of the objects he designs. I'm Eve Behar, and I am on Design Minds. I grew up in Switzerland in an environment and a culture in general that maybe um, didn't make me discover design very early on. I discovered design uh, maybe a little bit later. I was just very much drawn towards um, the idea of being able to, to do things on my own, to create things, to put them together. And I, I basically took things that were very uh, natural to me, things I loved to do, like skiing and windsurfing and combine them, for example, into this windsurfing on ice or on snow. The combination of skiing and sailing or windsurfing on snow was actually quite successful, maybe too successful because it was going really fast and it was really dangerous and it was something probably that I realized that I probably should go to school to do this right. Technology is an interesting place for me to be in because traditionally European designers tend to go into the furniture realm or into the home kind of environment as designers and um, I took a different path. About 15 years ago, it was the early 90s and it was a time when there was really a revolution going on in uh, Silicon Valley. Initially I, I was a part of um, a lot of the developments that happened around the personal computer, computers moving into the home, computers becoming part of our everyday life. We'd get into these meeting rooms and I would uh, be with these sort of program managers and project managers uh, and I would be like in the back of those rooms, a young designer, and I would kind of raise my hand and, and ask questions, stupid questions like, what's this numlock thing? You know, challenging a little bit what was there. It got really boring, simply because the role of the designer at the time was more the role of a, of a stylist, really, just making boxes pretty, but what was on the inside is basically the same or very much the same. And what I realized very quickly is I was challenging this notion of legacy. I was challenging the fact that there was a way things were and they weren't going to change. There must be a different way to practice industrial design in an environment often technology driven and that there must be another way to move forward with something I love to do. Essentially what I was interested in is to work on things that were meaningful. Projects that would be a lot more than the surfaces. I took this notion of technology and tried to apply it to um, everyday products. Apply it to um, uh, products that could just adjust or adapt to our lives. Some of the first projects we did were you know, really simple, but they used technology in a new way. This is the first watch that has a display that actually changes direction. I can check the time discreetly here as I'm talking to you without, you know, the whole sort of um, gesture. Here's another project about transformation. This was done with Swarovski. We did several years of work with them where we just experimented about what is the future of crystal. Crystal is really a material a few years ago that any person who is modernist or contemporary would not touch with a 10-foot pole. You know, it's a material anchored in classical decorative elements. 
then what Nadia Swarovski did is she invited these designers from around the world to really rethink what the material is, how it can be used, and how it can create new effects. Morpheus chandelier, as we call it, changes shapes. You install it once, and contrary to chandeliers, which typically just collect dust over a period of 50 years, you just have to draw it on, on a computer tablet. And the whole piece just transforms to a square, a circle, a heart, whatever you want to draw on there. Transformation and change is something that technology can give us. Um, but always in a way that really addresses the human, not so much in a way that, um, that gives us bigger hard drives. I met some young entrepreneurs that were just out of school, um, that had developed the technology to uh, get rid of environmental noise. Six years ago, we started working with them on a simple Bluetooth headset. By touching you, it knows it can differentiate between when it is that you're speaking and the noise that comes from the environment, getting rid of the environmental noise and keeping in your voice. The notion from the very beginning was that these products have to be human. If it's not beautiful, it doesn't belong in your face. You have the choice to look like a robot with like blinking lights here, or to sort of carefully pick your sunglasses and your watches, and these are the types of products. At the time, in Silicon Valley, it, you know, there, there wasn't really a sense of what lifestyles are, what fashion is, what culture is even. And so bringing this personal desire to the table and this kind of vision for the company essentially orientated the business towards doing products of this type. Luckily, they were young, and Hossein Rahman and Alex Asayi completely got it, and we sort of created a very different kind of company. We went from being zero, nobody, nobody had heard of us, to being the best-selling Bluetooth headset in the country. I see design at every level, you know, whether it's it's with Jawbone, which with whom we're doing a lot of different types of products, or whether it's with any incoming company in the studio, we see ourselves as part of the business creation process, really, um, and the brand creation process. Log on next week when Eve explains his seven axioms for design and why they're unquestionably essential to his creative approach.